We're excited for the grads today. We want to recognize them. It's quite an accomplishment. Uh, and, you know, the passage of Scripture that we're coming from today, and Margina, I apologize, you're in the NLT today, and I don't think I have a single Scripture reference from the NLT today, but mostly from the ESV and the NIV, but this passage today doesn't necessarily leap to mind when we think about celebrating the grads. But this is a book that's believed to have been written by Solomon, which Pastor Mark already alluded to is supposed to be the wisest man ever to walk on the face of the earth, right? Um, and this is Ecclesiastes 1.1. The ESV says that these, these are the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now, as we begin, I think these words, I have, to, I have to let you know, I think these words can easily be applied to students and grads because everyone is graduating from something, right? We're all graduating to the next thing. One chapter, one phase, one stage ends, and another begins. A student, student is actually a key term. You see, one interpretation of the Hebrew name of Ecclesiastes, I can't pronounce, but I'm going to give it a shot. Koheleth, okay? It's Q-O-H-E-L-E-T-H. And that means an ambassador of students. So Solomon is acting here as their teacher, instructing his students on how to understand and navigate this life, Okay? He concludes the book with his observations about the purpose of life. And in his closing remarks, we find four words or axioms or principles of wisdom that can be applied not only to high school and college grads, but actually it provides each and every one of us with wisdom for a lifetime. So let's take a look at today's passage. And like I said, this isn't going to be one that leaps to mind when you think about it, but here we go. I'm coming right now from the NIV. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Before the days of trouble come and years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain. When the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop. When the grinders cease because they are few. And those looking through the windows grow dim. When the doors to the street are closed and the sound of the grinding fades. When people rise up at the sound of birds but all their songs grow faint. When people are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags itself along and desire no longer is stirred, then people go to their eternal home and mourners go about the streets. Remember him before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the wheel is broken at the well and the dust returns to the ground that it came from and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. Not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. So now, let's take a look at those four words of wisdom. And the first one is this. Number one, get to know God early in your life. Come to know God early in your life, in your youth. In Ecclesiastes 12, 1, it says, remember your creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come and years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. To remember your creator means to think about God and to acknowledge him. According to, to a commentator, Warren Wearsby, the teacher here is telling his students, Hey, pay attention. You need to consider these words with the intention of obeying them. And the first word of wisdom is to make sure you learn about and get to know God when you're still young. In his book, Next Generation, George Barna says, about three quarters of all people who have consciously, intentionally, and personally chosen to embrace Jesus Christ as their Savior did so before their 18th birthday. After you hit your teenage years, it becomes more and more difficult to keep your mind open to hearing and receiving the word of the Lord, let alone surrendering your heart and life to him. It's also important to know the Lord before you encounter difficulties of what you might call grown-up life. When a valedictorian gives a speech, Paige, are you giving a speech? Where are you sitting? 
you're not getting to give a speech. You got rooked. Somehow you walk up there with something to say, okay? Anyway. When a valedictorian gives a speech at graduation, they'll usually talk about how great life is going to be from here on out. And I have to be honest, I actually like that. I do like that. It's good to be optimistic. It's wonderful to be hopeful, inspirational, and encouraging. But if we're candid and if we're honest, if you take the time to sit down and talk to someone who's been around for a while or any length of time, most will probably tell you that life comes with challenges and some difficulties. You don't get to look through rose-colored glasses all the time, right? And I'm not trying to be gloomy or dismal or some sort of killjoy here, but rather I am saying that if you've lived for for a while, you will find in this life you will have trouble. I think I've heard that somewhere before, right? Oh, yeah, I think Jesus said that in John 16, 33. Yet, it is not the whole story because Jesus himself continues and goes on to say, but take heart. I have overcome the world. But if you live for a significant period of time, trouble does find you somewhere along the line. Wearsby is a senior citizen, which means that he's lived at least a little bit in life. And he said, we know the dark days and difficult evil days are coming. So we had better lay a good spiritual foundation as early as possible. And during the years of our youth, the skies are often bright. But the time will come when there will be darkness with one storm after another. You see, the storms of life will eventually come. And without Jesus by your side, you can easily drown in a sea of hardship. Now, granted, you may have already endured some challenges as a teen. In fact, isn't being a teen just one great big challenge? Anyway, the truth is, life only gets more challenging and therefore harder. But if you take the Lord with you, you can better endure what lies ahead. Now let's move on to the second word found in verses 6 to 7. Know and serve God when you're old. That is, you still know him. In Ecclesiastes 12, 6 and 7, it says, Remember him before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the wheel is broken at the well and the dust returns to the ground it came from and the spirit returns to God who gave it. The cord in this verse, as you might have gathered, is symbolic of human life. The bowl and the pitcher represent the same thing. For example, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And then we see this wheel at the well. The, The wheel which turns to lift the water bucket, makes it easier to lift that water bucket up out of the well. And the wheel is symbolic of the turning in our lives, which are in constant motion. One day, however... The cord will break, the pitcher and the bowl, as we're told in Revelation 2, 27, will be dashed to pieces like pottery, and the wheel will stop working. This description is referring to aging. I just described some of that aging to you earlier when I said I'm sore, right? Our bodies weaken. They get run down. And when our body ceases to function and the dust returns to the ground it came from as it was, again, This is to be a picture of aging. And the second word of wisdom is to make sure that you still know and serve the Lord, or rather, that you have maintained, that you have nurtured your relationship with him, even as you grow older and to full maturity. Does anybody know when we reach full maturity? When the Lord takes you home, that's absolutely true. That's when you have reached full maturity. So you serve the Lord, you nurture that relationship until you've drawn your last breath. Now, maybe you're already a Christian, meaning that you have confessed and proclaimed Jesus as your Savior and Lord. But you need to realize that as you get out on your own and experience the freedom of making your own choices, you're going to be faced with many, many different life philosophies that run contrary or go against the Bible. And you're going to be tempted to choose other paths than the one God has laid out for you. Just remember what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. However, for the gate is narrow, the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So be sure to continue to walk or stay on the straight and narrow path all the days of your life. But then again, maybe you're not a Christian yet. It says in Ecclesiastes 3.20, all go to one place. 
All are from the dust, and to the dust all return. Now that sounds a lot like a phrase we've probably all become familiar with, probably one that you've heard, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. When our body goes back into the ground, the Bible teaches that our spirit will continue on either in spiritual life or in spiritual death. And spiritual life is spending eternity with God. And spiritual death is something you really don't want to experience. Because contrary to the way people joke and speak of it, hell isn't going to be a party, and it's not going to be a picnic. And you will find no relief or solace or comfort in the fact that all your so-called friends are there with you because they're going to be in just the same spot you are. So it's important that you come to know the Creator before you become dust, because you lose the chance after you die. Now, the way you come to know God is, is through a relationship with His Son. And if you know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, then as it says in today's passage, your spirit returns to God who gave it. Paul said, of those who have the hope of heaven in 2 Corinthians 5, 1, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now we move on to the third word found in verses 9 to 12. The best scholarship is from the Lord. Let the Lord be your teacher. In Ecclesiastes 9 to 12, it reads, not only was the teacher, in other versions it says preacher, wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched, weighed and studied, out and set in order many proverbs with great care. The teacher preacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collecting collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them, of making many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Here we learn that Solomon was very careful with his teaching so as to use right and acceptable words. They were to be pleasing and gracious, gracious words that would win the attention of his listeners as re and readers. However, at no time did he dilute his message or flatter his congregation. He, he always used upright words of truth, a truth he wanted them to hear, grasp, understand, and connect with. He claimed his words were inspired, given by God, the one shepherd. Inspiration was the special ministry of the Holy Spirit that enabled men of God to write the word of God as God wanted it written, complete and without error. For example, it says this in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God or God breathed and profitable or useful for teaching, for reproof, for rebuking, for corrections and for training in righteousness. I think actually here is that one NLT reference. I missed this one, Margie, when I was looking over it quick. Here's one, I think it's most clear in the NLT from this. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Also in 2 Peter 1, 20 to 21, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. Solomon compared God's words to goads and nails both of which are necessary if people are to learn God's truth. The goads, if you're a farmer, you know what a goad is. It's what gets the livestock going, right? It gets them going in the direction you want them to go. It prods them. It prods people to pay attention and to pursue truth. The nails give them something on which to hang what they've learned. And as I was thinking about it, nails also help us to build and hold things together. So in my mind, everything must be built on God's word, God's truth, and it's perfectly bound together. It gives us a rock-solid foundation, wisdom, if you will, on which to build your life. So too, good instructors, teachers, and preachers must be able to nail things down in a manner of speaking so that the lessons make sense and that they stick with you. We see in verse 12 that we're not to go beyond what God has written in his word. In Ecclesiastes 12, 12, be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them, of making many books, there is no end, and much study wearies the body. To be sure, there are all kinds of books and studying and reading. Everyone can be a wearisome chore. 
How many of you out there have been to grad school? Anybody? Was there a reading requirement when you were in grad school? And how many pages did they tell you had to read for every credit you were going to get for the class? Wasn't it some ridiculous sum? There you go, 1,500 pages. Is that per credit or was that for the whole thing? I couldn't remember. I don't remember. But 1,500 pages is a lot. And for some reason, I always had to buy eight or 10 books for one class because it didn't seem like the instructor could figure out who he wanted you to read. But anyway, it's an astronomical number of pages for the course requirement. But it says, do not let man rob you of God's wisdom. If you only have so much time to read, read the Bible. Read God's word. Are you guys listening out there today? Everything's so quiet. Either that or my, I have to turn the hearing aid up that I don't have. Something like that. Anyway, so to apply this, the third word of wisdom is that the very best scholarship comes from the Lord. The very best scholarship. And no, I'm not talking about money to pay for college, although I'm sure all of you are worried about getting scholarship money to help pay for college, okay? But scholarship refers to the words of a scholar. If you plan to attend college, then beware of man's wisdom and beware of the assault on the Christian faith. Author Satterali tells about a class exercise that took place at Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton in a course called Intercultural Communications. The professor asked the students to write Jesus' name in big letters on paper and place the paper on the ground and then stomp on the name of Jesus. Ryan Rotella, a junior, refused. Ryan was polite. He was sincere. He calmly disagreed with the professor's request and refused to do the exercise. And he paid the consequences for his refusal, suspension. And the university supervisor told him never to return to, cl to the class. Now, candidly, I've experienced similar things, not to that level of persecution. But you, when you go to college or university, you are going to encounter a lot of self-proclaimed scholars whose primary goal is to refute the Christian faith, claiming that they know better. But keep in mind that true scholarship is contained within the Bible by the words of the one true shepherd and teacher. And honestly, there are more than a few professors who think they are God of their classroom, and in the school site, they are. But they are wannabes. They are posers. They play God, and they let you know it. They play God trying to make you renounce the one true God, but do not be deceived and do not fall for it. Warren Wiersbe writes, the nails upon which you as a believer hang your faith are sure and you can depend on them. And he advises, do not test God's truth by the many books written by men, but instead test man's books by the truth of God's word. Our textbook is the Bible and the Holy Spirit is our teacher. The Spirit can use gifted human teachers to instruct us, but the Lord longs to teach us personally from his word. Now the last few verses, word four, the most meaningful pursuit in life is God. Glorify him. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14 says, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. In Ecclesiastes 1-2, Solomon begins his book by saying, Vanity of the vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? You know, there are 28 other times when he uses the term vanity in reference to show how he felt about life. The prospect of getting, out on your, of getting out on your own can and honestly should be exciting. But there will come a point in your life, whether soon or later, when you might feel as Solomon and think that life is meaningless. But thankfully, Solomon discovered his higher purpose. More on that in a moment. The fourth and final word of wisdom here is that most meaning, the most meaningful pursuit in life is God. Upon graduation... It's exciting, no doubt about it. Exciting to get out and pursue your options to seek the future, your options for the future, your career. You're going to chase your dreams. It's also necessary 
for your financial well-being and security when it comes to a job. Because without security and a good job, you're not going to be in a position to raise a family, let alone have a positive influence on society. But you need to make sure that your career choice is not the end, but a means to an end. And the end being to bring glory to God. Otherwise, your life will start feeling empty, just like Solomon. Hopeless, meaningless, a chasing after the wind. It's been said that some people are only spending their lives while other people are wasting their lives. But only a few are investing their lives. Corey Ten Boom said, I love this, The measure of a life, after all, is not its duration, but its donation. My friends, those of you that are just entering a next phase or a next chapter or closing a phase or a chapter or ending a new stage of life, whatever it is, what are you giving? What's your donation going to be? If our lives are to count, we must fulfill three obligations that are mentioned in verses 13 and 14, mostly 13. We should, number one, fear God. The fear of the Lord is that attitude of reverence and awe that his people show to him because they love him and they respect his power and his greatness. The person who fears the Lord will not tempt him by deliberately disobeying or playing with sin. The second is to keep his commandments. God created life and he knows how it should be managed. He's the one who wrote the instruction manual. We just found out today in CE that somebody is writing a new Bible based on how PETA feels about things. Can you believe that? We don't believe that God has the right words. We're going to correct God. Bunk! It's all bets bunk. Okay? That's not the Bible. Okay? We're talking about the Bible here, God's word. The Bible is the instruction manual which God wrote through the presence of the Holy Spirit and in, in, into those gentlemen. And wise is the person who reads and obeys it. When all else fails, read the instructions. Read the instruction manual. All right? Number three, prepare for final judgment. For God will bring every deed into judgment. You may seem to get away with your sins, but your sins will eventually be exposed and judged righteously. If you die having never trusted in Jesus Christ, you will face judgment at his throne and be lost forever. It says this in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Your job, your occupation should never become your sole reason for your existence. And your career preparation should never distract you from growing in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You need to try and be careful to balance your study for classes, school, college, university, and Bible study. And please keep in mind that the most important pursuit above your career is God and then your family. Jobs, jobs come and go, especially in America today. Jobs come and go. But your relationship with Jesus Christ, that can and should be forever. That should be forever. The one part we left out in verse 13 underscores our duty. Fear God and keep his commands, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment. So, is life worth living? Yes, it is. If you tr are truly alive through faith in Jesus Christ, then you can be satisfied no matter what God may permit to come into your life. In 1 John 5, 12, it says, Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Now, the truth is, life has no meaning apart from God. That's why we find this in Colossians 3, 7. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Then in Colossians 3, whatever you do, Work heartily at it as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. There are many jobs and opportunities that can bring us a sense of fulfillment, but if we have failed to use our occupations and pursuits as a way to serve and glorify the Lord, then we're ultimately going to end up, wind up, feeling empty. It will be and feel meaningless like a chasing after the wind. 
our worldly victories will become empty successes. God created us to worship and serve him. That is our duty. That is our primary purpose. Glorify God in all we do. So as you graduate from high school or college or university or onto the next stage or phase of life, and you begin to make your mark on the world, remember the four words of wisdom from this passage. Get to know God when you're young. Serve God all the days of your life and continue to grow your relationship with him. Understand that the best knowledge and wisdom come from the Lord and be sure to place wisdom of the Bible far above all the words of men. And number four, always keep in mind that the most meaningful pursuit in life is God. We're to glorify him. But none of these things will be useful unless the most important piece of the puzzle is in place, which is to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'd like us all to bow our heads right now and have a word of prayer together.